passed away almost 20 years ago, actually exactly 20 years ago. And I'm going to use both of their readings to look at the book of Genesis. But I want to say something about what I mean with a narrative and a hidden narrative. And I'm going to use this week's uh, parasha of a Noach and Noah's Ark. Noah is blamed, is usually blamed by Chazal as being, um, it's called the tzaddik in pelts. He takes care of himself and he doesn't take care of the world. The commentators that don't like Noach always compare him to Abraham. The, both of them received a message of destruction for other people. Abraham stood up for those people and Noah took care of himself. That's what in Hasidut is called a tzaddik in pelts. If it's cold in the room, you can do one, one or two things. You can either light a fire and then it's warm for everybody or put on a sweater. And Noah has always been being blamed for the one putting on a sweater. Because when God says to Abraham, there's a terrible city, Sdom, Sadim, and I'm gonna wipe it out. So even though it's full of these terrible people, Abraham has this whole Masao Matan, and he goes into this whole argument with God, 50, 40, 30, 20, save the city if there's 10 people there. And when God says to Noah, um, I grew up on a Bill Cosby record with uh, Noah, I don't know if others are familiar with this, um, that he's going to destroy the world. So Noah says, okay, when are we starting? And he goes and, and he builds the, the ark and he doesn't say anything. He, he, he never questions God. And if you want to go into a deeper reading of the book of Genesis, Noah was supposed to be Abraham because the Torah uses the same words. Tzaddik, Tamim, Yireh Elohim. He's a righteous person and he's God-fearing. He was supposed to be Abraham, but when he failed to be Abraham, he ends up like Lot, Abraham's um, nephew, who um, turns out he's, um, the last scene with Lot is when he's drunk uh, because his daughters make him drunk because they want children after Sodom and Amorah. And Noah's final picture is very much like Lot. He's drunk in his tent and something happens with his uh, younger son, with Ham. So Noach is usually blamed. I love Noach, and I don't like this interpretation. And for years, I was looking of a different way of reading Noach. And when I was, like, to give an example of what I mean by text and subtext, or narrative and hidden narrative, so Rashi, um, maybe the most famous commentator of Tanakh, Rabbi Shlomo Yitzchaki, has a beautiful reading of Noach. I'm going to share the screen for a second for a source. It's not in your source sheets. And I'm going to read one verse from this week's portion. So um, can you see the screen that I shared? Yeah? Okay. So we're in um, verse 18. Noah is about to enter the ark. And... It says, but I will establish my covenant with you. This is what God says to Noah. And you shall enter the ark with your sons, your wife, and your son's wives. Now, if you look up Rashi later, I should have put this in the source sheet and I apologize. Rashi has a beautiful, subtle, very subtle interpretation. He reads, and he's a very close listener, and the verse says, Ata uvanecha, you and your sons, ve'ishtecha, your wife, and your son's wives. So Rashi says that God was very specific about saying the men should enter separately from the women. Rashi says this was a hint to Noah that while they're in the ark, they're not allowed to have sexual relations. And Rashi quotes a passage from the Talmud, from a tractate Tanit, saying that when there's um, famine in the world, you're not, allowed, um, you're not allowed to bear children. The reasons could be one of two reasons. One, that if there is not enough food for the mouths that we already have to feed, we're not going to bring more children into the world. The other is more like a moral um, standing. Like people are dying outside. It can't be that you're closed in your ark and, and there's nothing relating between you and what's going on. 
Now this beautiful reading of Rashi carries out through the whole portion, through the whole parasha, because when Noah enters the ark, and I didn't bring all the verses, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. When Noah actually enters the ark, so it says, he came into the ark, he and his sons and his wife and his son's wives. Now what's beautiful is that's all Rashi says. He never says anything else in the parasha about that. But if you're close enough readers now, and if we, we listen to what Rashi has to say, then we'll realize that when God speaks to Noah and says to him, I want you to exit from the ark, he says, teva, go out of the ark, ishtecha, uvanecha unshevanecha. you and your wife and your sons and your wife's sons. So it's like, if we were listening now, we understand exactly what God is saying. The flood is over, and God speaks to Noah and says, now I want you out of the ark, you and your wife, and your, son, and your sons and your sons' wives. So Noah is supposed to understand that God is saying, okay, there's a new world to create, now it's time. The amazing thing comes two verses later. When Noah actually exits the ark, it says, Vayetzed Noach, and Noach exited, he and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives. Now, we would never have noticed if Rashi hadn't pointed out, this is the first big disobedience of humanity. God says to Noah, I want you to have children. Exit you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives. Noah says, no. We, we're not even aware of the fact that Noah looked up at God and said no. And if you read the Midrash, there's a beautiful commentary that says that Noah looks up at God and says, what do you want me to bring more children into this world for? So when you get angry again, you'll destroy them too? I'm not playing this game. But it's not there in the narrative. It just says that he exited with his sons and his wife exited with his sons' wives. Now, suddenly Noach is a different character. It's not the one who didn't argue with God. He, um, it's like, is there a saying in English, um, still waters run deep, something like that? Yeah? Noach is maim shketim, he's still waters. He didn't get up there and scream at God and say, how can you do such a thing? And we don't have any heroic picture of Noah standing up and saying, what kind of God are you? He just quietly said, no, I'm not taking part in this game. And by the way, he was a much bigger success than Abraham was. The city of Sodom wasn't saved, but God was convinced by Noah's argument. And he says, okay, and he brings out the rainbow and he says, you know what, I understand. Okay, we're not gonna play that game anymore. I promise you, I'm never gonna do this again. And the verse after that says that Noah has more children. So his argument was one. And I just want to bring this as an example of a narrative and a hidden narrative, because we could have missed out on Noah um, completely. What's nice about Rashi is he respects Noah. And because Noah isn't a kind of person that gets up and screams, Rashi didn't scream his, his argument either. Rashi was very, very quiet. And he said, I'll give you a hint here. And if you carry out reading it through the whole parsha, you'll realize what a hero Noah was. But it's only for if we're really there to listen. So I want to look at the book of Genesis like that now with the two narratives. One that I think is really on the surface of the book. And the other that I think is um, like an underlying narrative or a, a subtext, a very strong subtext in, in the book. We'll run through them quickly. As I said, we'll try and use Nachmanides, Ramban, from Barcelona, from Girona, 13th, 12th and 13th century in Yudha Michai. So um, in many ways, the two narratives that I want to speak about are the English name of the book and the Hebrew name of the book. What my children call Bereshit, your children call Genesis. And, um, and those are two different names. It's always interesting to look at the two names. If we move to the next book, Exodus, by the way, is a much better name than Shmot. 
Shmot is just taking the second word of the book, Ele Shmot Bnei Israel. Exodus is the main event of the book. And in many ways, the English names capture the essence of the book much better than the Hebrew um, way of just taking the first or second word of the book. But um, I always think there's an, a deep meaning. I think, by the way, Shemot has a very deep meaning. There's a lot to talk about names in the book of Exodus, names and their meaning, the name of Moses and the name of Pharaoh and God's name, which is the, the missing link in the book. There's many names there. But um, if we look at Bereshit and Genesis, they say two opposites. Genesis is basically saying that it's all about genes. Besides being a singing group from the 1980s that I really liked, um, it also means that things carry from generation to generation. The Hebrew parallel, by the way, to the word Genesis would be toldot. And the word toldot really carries throughout the whole book of Genesis. From the second chapter, these are the offsprings of the heaven and the earth. We human beings are the offsprings of the heaven and the earth. And then there's Eletoldot Adam, and Eletoldot Shem, Eletoldot Noach, Eletoldot Avraham, Eletoldot Yitzchak. That's the story of the book. It's a story of genetics and of family. And, um, and it's a very good name for the book of Genesis. And one of the people who does who grabs onto that word Genesis and really wants to say that this is the heart of the book is Nachmanides, Rabbi Moshe ben Nachman. And, um, and I'll turn to the source sheets here for a second. Those of you who are holding the source sheets in front of you, I'm gonna start with source number three. And um, one second, I'm not sure I have them here on screen, I apologize. This will take me a second. Um, oh, oops, I apologize. Um, this is okay. okay, the link here and now. Um, I will now, oh. sorry, it's not letting me into the sources. Well, it is here, here it is. Okay, um, I'll try this now, I apologize. Can you see the sources now? Are we fine? Yeah, so, um, so we're here now in source number three, and I'm starting with Nachmanides. Nachmanides, an, a very, very um, wide, broad interpreter. He writes on everything, on Tanakh and on Talmud and on Kabbalah, and he has a very interesting life, and he comes to Jerusalem towards the end of his life. And um, in, in, in his interpretation of the book of Genesis, he writes the following, I will tell you a general principle, understand it in all the coming sections about Abraham, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and it is a great matter. Our rabbis mentioned it in a brief way and said, everything that occurred to our forefathers is a sign for the children. In Hebrew, the term is ma'aseh avot siman lebanim. Everything that happened to our parents will happen to us. And he says, if you want to understand the book of Genesis, and I'll basically say this later on, on the whole Tanakh, if you want to understand the Tanakh, I'll even say it about our history. If you want to understand everything that's going to happen, you need to look at what happened to Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And I'll give two or three examples. So he'll say, first of all, things carry from generation to generation. He'll take, um, for example, Isaac and Abraham. And I'll say, look, everything that happened to Abraham happened to Isaac. He has a wife. She's beautiful. They go down to Egypt. The, the king of the enemy sees his wife, wants to marry her. Then he feels bad. Then he sends him away. 
then they both have two sons. One is a good son, the other is not a good son. He sends one son away and one son stays there. He says, that's the book of Genesis. Everything carries on in the genes. He'll say it even more than that. He'll say, think of Abraham. Abraham, there was famine in the land of Israel. So this is in source number four. I'm not going to read through it because of the time, but you can read on later. He'll say, look, everything happens the same. There's famine in Israel. Abraham needs to go down to Egypt. He's um, treated terribly by the king of Egypt. Then God brings a lot of infliction on the king of Egypt, and he sends him away with lots of cattle, silver, and gold. And then Nachmanides will say, hey, does that sound familiar? Us going down to Egypt, the king treating us not nicely, God inflicting the king with punishment, and then him sending us away with all. So he'll say, it's all ma'aseh avot siman lebanim. But he says even more than that. When, when he's looking at, um, he says, second temple was destroyed because we couldn't get along with each other, because brothers were fighting, and because of, our, the brothers fighting, we went down to Egypt. He says, look, it's just like Yaakov and Yosef, uh, or Yosef and Yehuda, Judah and Joseph. The brothers are fighting. One needs to go down to Egypt. Then we all go into exile. The second, same thing happened 2,000 years later. Um, Nachmanides, in his introduction to the book of Genesis, basically reads Genesis as a DNA for all of Jewish history. I said he was a Kabbalist. He goes into Gimatria and he counts letters and he'll say, it's all there. Everything is there. And if we're close enough readers, we'll find, we'll find everything. I'll show the source that I skipped. Number two, this is not Nachmanis, but this Midrash from Genesis Rabbah is exactly what he's trying to say. He says in the words, the second verse of the Torah, that the earth was chaos. Tov avo al so he'll say that that little verse kind of condenses all of Jewish history for the next 3,000 years. Chaos is Babylon, and darkness is Greece, and the surface of the deep is what's going on in his time. So Nachmanides, he's not the only one, but he's the one who does this, I mean, think in the most um, clear, or precise fashion, is he's saying everything is there. Again, everything that occurred to our forefathers is a sign for the children. I'll, um, I'll go back to the source in a second. When my, my wife's a social worker, my wife, Anat. So in her studies, I remember she came home one day with something called the genogram. Some of you might be familiar if you're uh, into psychology or sociology. or A genogram is basically like a family tree, but it's a very rich family tree. And you write everything that happened to the generations prior to you. Um, big things like life and death, sickness, move from one country to another, change occupation, big things, numbers of children. It's scary to look at your genogram. For most people, there's a moment where they look at that page, that's it, what happened to me, and they say, what, I didn't make any of my own decisions in my life? Like nothing belongs to me. You know, I, I grow up and you think you're living your own life. So I'm a Jewish educator, just like my father was a Jewish educator. And we both went into informal education. My father was a camp prima for many years. But I feel that I've really created a path of my own on my life because he worked with 17 to 19 year olds and I'm with 21 to 23 year olds. So see, I'm, I'm living my own life. And I'm not going to do what my parents did. I want to I wanna choose my own profession, right? My wife's a social worker. Her mother's a social worker. My wife works with people um, with addictions. But uh, so does her mother. <laughs> but her mother was more drugs and my, my wife's more alcohol. So like she's chosen her own path in life. So this genogram is very scary, but basically what I want to say, what Nachmanides is saying, and I'm going to go to the hidden narrative, is that the narrative, he says that Genesis is a great name for this book. Because not only um, does Isaac do everything that Abraham did, the next generations are going to do what Abraham did. 
throughout the Tanakh, everything is going to happen in the same way. The dispute between Yehuda and Yosef, between Judah and Joseph, is going to carry throughout Jewish history. Okay, and Judah and Joseph have a quarrel, just like their mothers, Rachel and Leah, and just like their daughters, and the kingdom of Judah and Israel will carry it out for the next 2,000 years. And when Mashiach comes, hopefully soon, then tradition says there's going to be two different messiahs, Mashiach ben Yosef, the son of Joseph, and Mashiach ben David from the tribe of Judah. So it's like it'll carry through Genesis is our history. So now I'm putting that aside, and I want to read the second narrative for a second. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the sources for one second. I'll end this with Yehuda Michai. Look at Yehuda Michai's beautiful reading. Yehuda Michai has a poem called All the Generations Before Me. It's source number five on your sheets. And he writes the following. All the generations before me donated me, bit by bit, bit by bit. So I might be erected here in Jerusalem all at once, like a house of prayer or foundation for charity. It binds. My name is my donor's name. It binds. I am approaching the age when my father died. My will is patched with surfeit of patches. I must change my life and my death day by day and so fulfill all the prophecies that prophesied about me so they don't become a lie. It binds. I've passed the age of 40. There are jobs for which they will not take me on that account. If I were in Auschwitz, they would not have sent me out to labor. They would have instantly fed me to the flames. It binds. Think of something, somebody growing up, looking at Jewish history and feeling that he has 3,000 years of history on his shoulders. Every day of his life, he has to make a different prophecy fulfill. And the term in Hebrew, Zemechayev, or the translation here, that it binds, that's the strong feeling of Genesis. I don't know how every one of you listening heard the sentence, Maseh Avot Lebanim, that the deeds of our fathers are a sign for us. I don't know how you heard it as children, as parents, as siblings, as educators. What do we do with that sentence? So Nachmanides is the reading of Maseh Avot Lebanim. And I want to start the other reading, the hidden narrative, again with Yehuda Michai with a different poem of his, a bit more familiar, saying the exact opposite, or maybe the exact opposite. This is a very short poem called, We Are All Children of Abraham. We are all children of Abraham, but also the grandchildren of Terach, Abraham's father. And maybe it's time the grandchildren did unto their fathers as he did unto his, when he shattered his idols and images his religion, his faith. That too would be the beginning of a new religion. Let's look at this poem again. Okay, we're all children of Abraham, he says, but we're also the grandchildren of Terach, Abraham's father. Now, according to the tradition, Abraham shatters the idols and images of his father. So he says, maybe it's about time we did to Abraham what he did to his father. Now we're in a bit of a paradox here or a quandary or um, something that doesn't work. Because if we shatter Abraham's idols, we're being very traditional. We're doing exactly what our parents did. So it's like we can't escape being traditional. Either we're traditional, we do what Abraham did and don't shatter anything, and then we're very traditional. Or that we shatter his idols, but then we're doing exactly what Abraham did. He shattered his father's idols. But I think what Yehuda Michai is pointing to in here, I'll, I'll say in short the hidden narrative, which I think is a very, very strong narrative in the book of Genesis. The hidden narrative starts with Abraham. Two words, lech lecha. Arise, go forth. Lech lecha me'artzecha me'lecha beit avicha. In a book where the, the not hidden narrative, the narrative on the surface is we're exactly like our parents, to say to the major character of the book, 
leave your family and leave your homeland, that's working against the narrative. Lech Lecha is getting up and saying, no, I don't want anything to do with this. So suddenly we hear a different voice within the book of Genesis. God's first command to humanity or to the human nation that he chose is, I want you to work against nature. I want you to do Bereshit, not Genesis. I want you to start from the beginning and not do anything the way that your parents did it. And by the way, if we walk through Genesis, we can dismantle slowly but surely every one of the things that Nachmanides said, because it seems like Isaac is exactly like Abraham, but it's totally not true. He's almost like him. He goes to a different country and his wife is beautiful, but he's not willing to tell stories about her. So the other king doesn't even take his wife. And he has two kids, and one of them is a good one, and the other is uh, less good. But he doesn't throw one out of the house. He keeps them in the house, and he takes care of both of them. And everything that happens to Abraham happens to Isaac. But Isaac doesn't take another wife when his wife is barren. So it's the same circumstances, but he behaves differently. And if you want to walk through Tanakh or history, the Nachmanides is almost correct. Because it's true that everything in Tanakh is very, very similar to what happened in Bereshit. But it's similar, not so we can relive the same tradition and make the same mistakes. We're given a new chance every time to live the sa exact same circumstances, but behave totally differently. And the scene in the end of the book of Genesis is when, when Jacob is falling on his bed, begging Joseph to take his um, bones to the land of Israel. And the end of the book of Genesis says, we're not dependent on our parents. We're dependent on our children. The last verse of Genesis is Joseph saying to his descendants, please carry me to the land of Israel. So this, the upside down story of Genesis is saying, it's not Maseavot Siman Lebanim. We're not, it's not that our parents have determined everything that's gonna to happen to us in our lives. Everything that we've done in our lives is basically determined or is put in the hands of our descendants. Ecclesiastes that we just read in Sukkot says this and he's very upset about it. He says, no matter what you do, it's worthless because your kids are gonna ruin it all. And, um, and the book of Genesis says the same thing with a smile. It says, it's not that whatever you do is worthless. It is, whatever you do is not finished yet. There's still a chance. Something good can still come of this. There's always another generation that's gonna be able to work with, with what we've done. Um, I'll pause in a second for questions and just, um, I'm telling something about genetics and I, I, I told a story about my parents. So I have to say something about my kids. So uh, I have 17 year old twins, twin girls. And, um, and when I was a young Abba, they were about a year and a half old. I remember I gave one of my first classes here in Beth Platt and they were just starting to talk these two little cute whatevers, schlunkies. And, um, and I remember that my first class was about what the best word a father can hear from his children is. I asked him, what do you think the best word that a father can hear from his, his daughter? And people were guessing Abba, and it wasn't the answer. And they were guessing Toda, thank you, which I don't know, I haven't heard that yet. Maybe when they reach 30. 
um, and many, many different words. But the word that I spoke about was the word lo, the word no. I remember their first time. They were like a year and a half old. I don't remember what I asked them to do, but it was a uh, very one of them. I remember her standing up, looking at me with this big smile with, with huge eyes and saying, lo. And I remember that I burst out laughing. And um, later on, I thought, what was so special about that moment? And you have a child, 16 or 17 months old, never really did anything except what you told them to do. When you wanted them to sleep, you put them there, to eat, you put them there. And suddenly in one word, she looks at you and she says, Abba, my name is Barry. I have a personality of my own. I know that's what you want me to do, but I want to do something different. And the amazing thing about the hidden narrative of the book of Genesis is if we go back through all the parents and children, we go back to the first parents and children and we're the children of, the, of God, the Kadosh Baruch Hu. We also say no. In Gan Eden, we say no. He says, don't eat of the, from the tree. And we say, man, that looks like a nice tree. Maybe we should eat some of it. And I think that when they ate from the tree, God burst out laughing. Because suddenly humanity gets up and says, hey, we're going to be the ones that are telling your story. So the, the narrative of the book of Genesis is very traditional. We're just like our parents. And all of humanity is just like their parent. They're going to do exactly what their parents told them to do. But the hidden narrative, the one that says lech lecha, the one with the parents asking from their children to take care, is a totally different narrative. And I think it carries a very strong message, also personally and also theologically. That's a look at Genesis for a moment. And um, I'm going to pause for a second. I want to speak for a few minutes, maybe later on at the times we're going through and of how I think of this parsha or the reading of the book with what's going on outside. But maybe we'll take a few um, comments or thoughts and, or, and if this is a good time. If not, I'll go on. <laughs> Donnie? Yeah. Uh, Wes, and I just want to say, first of all, thank you for a really brilliant analysis. I've been studying Genesis my whole life, and I never before saw that tension between Genesis. We are, you know, Ma'asa, Votsi, Manlavanim, what do kids do? And then the counter narrative of Lech Lecha, uh, no, the importance of no. And your class that was really sparkling made me think of the first line of the book, Far From the Tree, which is about parents and children. The first line is, there is no such thing as reproduction, only production. There is no such thing as reproduction, only production. There is no such thing as reproduction. There is no such thing as ma'asa avot siman levanim that only exists in Nachmanides' head. There's only production because no, uh, lecha, I'm going to do it my way, is just an inevitable part of being human. So thank you uh, for that. It was just really quite, quite insightful and novel and wonderful. Let me throw it open to our, uh, to your 70 students here. And Amy, maybe you'll just call on folks uh, whose hands you see. Amy, just one second. Just thank you very much, Wes. And before I take questions, I just want to relate to a few things that you said. First of all, um, when I was thinking of a title for this book, I wasn't aware, for the class, I wasn't aware of your book, Fire from the Tree. But in Hebrew, I wanted to say, that the apple falls far from the tree. And I think that's very true. And when you were talking now, I thought that there, there could be a nicer or more subtle interpretation to Masa Avot Siman Lebanim. I think it's very true that our parents create a path for us. Ma'aseh Avot Siman Lebanim is very true that things that they've done are easier for us to do. So I don't want to put that sentence aside. I think it's very powerful. But I think it enables us to do things. It doesn't force us to do things. 
it's very true in, in opening the path, but not, not in closing our, our options. Right. Right. So it's, it, it creates influence, but there's no guarantee. Nothing. It creates influence, but there's no guarantee. And as often as kids do what their parents want them to do, famously kids don't do what their parents want them to do. <laughs> they have to live with both of those. And that's an ongoing creative tension from the time of the Torah to now. Okay. So thank you. So you want to pick up, you want to, you want to uh, call on some people. Sure, I see a question from Lori Polichuk. Lori? Huh. Can, you, can you hear me? We hear you and we see you. Okay, perfect. I can't see me for some reason, but. <laughs> so first of all, that was brilliant and really thank you so much. So I was thinking when you were speaking about this kind of, um, the, well, what, what Wes said and what you said that, that there's no reproduction, only production. I was thinking, what is the parent's responsibility to pass on or expose kids to tradition? And I guess <laughs> from my perspective, sometimes a corresponding guilt about what was not passed on and ought to have been passed on. I guess the flip side of seeing your kids move into their lives as something that's wonderful and seeing your kids move into a life that's separate as something that's scary and maybe you did something wrong, you know, in, in that happening. So I was wondering your thoughts about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I don't know if uh, <laughs> how many answers I have. I'm struggling with six at the moment. <laughs> um, I heard somebody speak. It was actually, he was talking, uh, he was giving a hesped, a eulogy for his father. And it was beautiful because he said, um, Abba, you always said to me, he said, um, children will le never listen to what their parents say, but they'll always see what they do. And, um, and then he spoke for a few minutes about how he never listened to what his father said, but he was always very aware about what his father does. And, um, and he spoke beautifully about the things he learned from what, how his father conducted himself in his life. And I think um, the term in Hebrew, if I take it apart, the word siman is like a sign. And that's the way I think it should be. It's like the acts of our parents are like a sign to us. Now, when you see a sign, some, sometimes you abide to the sign. Sometimes you don't do exactly what the sign says, but the sign is there. And our ability to be there as a siman labanim, we're not deciding upon their lives. We can never push too hard, um, but we're always there to put the sign up, to raise the sign. Here, ma'asev ot siman labanim. So um, that's always my hope, that uh, in the, words, the way we're conducting ourselves, that we're able to be that sign. Thank you, mine too. Donnie, you just yeah. a follow on your you has, on the Hesper on the eulogy, um, you know when I when I hear people talk about their parents, the big compliment they pay is that my my dead father dead mother loved me unconditionally. They love me for who I am. Here's my question to you: Do you think the message of Judaism and the message of Genesis and Bereshit, when you put it all together, is that parents should love their children unconditionally? Is there a mitzvah? of unconditional parental love? Or is there a mitzvah of no, not unconditional parental love because that there's not enough standards built into that? That's a great question. I and mean, I can say something, I'm not sure I'm saying it about unconditional love, but another story of Genesis, I think is that our nation starts as a family. And one of the things about family is there's no choice. In Hebrew, there's a saying, Mishpacha lo bocharim. Like you're always there. We're always family. We can fight. That's why I'm not sure I want to use the term unconditional love, but I want to say that we're unconditionally always there for each other. Because um, in family, there's many different feelings. It can be love and it can be anger and it can be misunderstandings and so many other things. But I want, I want my kids to know that I'm always, always there. 
And, um, and when I told my daughter the other night to come home by 1 a.m. and she didn't, I want her to know that when it's 2.30 and she needs to come home, she can call me and I'll pick her up because she needs to come home and I'm her Abba. We might fight about it. I might be angry later, but there's something about the sense of family. Um, we could talk about something else in Bereshit, Yibum. I don't know the word in, in English, the mitzvah of- Lever at, lever at marriage. Yeah, it's, it's a very strange and it's always on the side, but I think it's very, it's very, it has a strong place in the book of Bereshit because it's about family. Always being there for family, never leaving somebody. So we could have told our, our story in many ways. And the fact that we chose to tell the story of our nation as starting with a family, so it's, it's unconditional. I'm not sure about the word love, but the connections, I think, are unconditional, yeah. That's part of the family story in my eyes. Thank you, Danny. Amy, other questions from the crowd? I don't see any. Am I missing anybody who has a question? If I am, wave at your screen so I can see you or put it in the chat. <laughs> I'll ask one last question that's on my mind if nobody else has one. Donnie, yeah, your, your parents 47 years ago today, you know, made Aliyah. And that was the defining choice that they made that made you into an Israeli Jewish educator. Here's my question for you. Let's say one of your 17 year old twins does her own lechlecha and says, dad, I want to move to Texas. I'm moving to Texas. This Israel thing is great for you. It doesn't work for me. I love Texas. Texas forever. And if you want to see me, come to San Antonio, where I'm going to build my life. How would you view that? We have a, a joke at home. My, my girls, they know they can marry anybody, any religion, any place, anything, except somebody who's a supporter of Maccabi Tel Aviv, which is the basketball team that I don't like. So uh, more or less, those are the rules of the house. They can do anything besides Maccabi Tel Aviv. Um, it's easy to say, we have these discussions and they really ask me, the kids, what if I do this? What if I do this? They're, and I try and say, I'm always there. I'm always there. Um, Texas is kind of far. Like what happened to Teaneck, New Jersey? Whatever they, they choose, um, I hope to be there. Um, Mamash, here in any other place, I know, like I think of my parents when they came, I don't know, my Safta, 47 years ago, when, when my mother got on the plane to a country, by the way, at war, it was the end of the Yom Kippur War. I don't know if she thought she would ever see her or when she would see her again. That was a very strong lech lecha. And, um, and they did it with a lot of love, my grandparents. I hope that I can, uh, I know my parents were that way for me. I hope I can be that way for my children. I want to say one last thing about these times, because I know there's a lot of turmoil. There's a flood outside. There's a mabul. We had a beautiful commentary called the Netivot Shalom, the Rebbe of Slonim. And he, he was saying that every, every person has three different arcs. In Judaism, we have three arcs. One he calls the Shabbat. He says Shabbat is an arc in our life. Torah is an arc. And he says that unity, Achdut Israel, is a third ark. And when there's turmoil outside, we enter the ark. And um, and I was thinking of um, of what we're supposed to do today with the turmoil outside. And I'll say two things, because I think in Chasidut, many times people say in this parsha, okay, when there's turmoil outside, just enter your ark. And that's how we were for many, many years. Things were going on outside and we said, okay, we have an ark to enter and then we're fine. It's not the kind of people I think we, we strive to be. I think we wanna be out there also in the streets or uh, saying something or writing or acting or doing whatever we can when, when things are happening. And um, I read um, Nomi Shemir 
wonderful, wonderful Israeli writer. Uh, she also passed away about 15 years ago. I'm sure many of you are familiar with her. She wrote Yerushalayim Shel Zahav, Jerusalem of Gold. She grew up in Kineret, on the Kineret, in a little Moshava kibbutz called Kineret. And she was a sang writer. She wrote beautiful um, melodies and words. And when she went to study music, the people in the kibbutz weren't happy with her going to study music. That had nothing to do with real life in the kibbutz. You had to learn how to plow a field or to do something that would bring money into the kibbutz. And she fought with all of them and she went to study music. And her mother wrote her a letter from the Kineret, which by the way, her son put a tune to that letter and it's a beautiful song that he sings, her grandson. So the mother writes to Nomi Shemil, to her daughter, she says, I'm sitting by the Kineret and there's a Sarah, there's a storm and there's big waves. And I'm thinking of the storm in your heart now and of the waves that you're going through and of all the turmoil. And she says, I see outside on the Kineret a fisherman and I have no idea how he's gonna get his boat back to the shore. And the only thing he can do to save his boat from drowning, she says, is to put more weight into his boat. And then it'll be able to carry throughout the storm. And she writes to her daughter about going to study music. With everything going on outside, she's saying, you're putting weight in our boat. You're giving us, and I'm thinking you're everything that, I know you have elections in a week and a bit. And with everything going on outside, what it means to take a Sunday morning and to think of who we are and what we want to do in this world. To take our Ark of Torah, to put more weight into our boat so we can be the real Noach, not the one who's a tzaddik and pelts who takes care of himself, but Noach who knows who he is, what he wants to do in this world, and in his very special ways, sometimes very subtle and quiet, to stand up for what he believes in. So we, I hope in this uh, world, with everything going on outside, we can be real noachs. And I want to thank you very much for this time, a special hour of afternoon here, and a wonderful time of learning with you. So tada rabba, and have a good week. Uh, Donnie, let me just say, uh, from all of us here at Temple Manual, we're so grateful to you. There's just so many rich takeaways from your Torah. Uh, you know, you, you began it by um, concretizing your whole lecture foreshadowing it with Noah, the Noah who's really not so hot because he doesn't compare to Abraham, but the Noah who is the still water that, that runs deepest and in his own way uh, protests and uh, tells God that uh, I'm not gonna play this game. And then you ran that same theme through with your, your reading of Genesis through uh, as, as um, Genesis, as genes, as the primacy of parents shaping kids' lives, the Nachmanides lens, and then the entire counter read uh, of um, there's no such thing as production, only production, and showing us both tensions in the poetry of Yehuda Amichai. And you just left us with so much thinking, and it's just so rich. And what a bracha that you could give us, uh, you know, 10 days out from a very, uh, from a very stressful, anxious moment for our nation and for each of us individually. Yeah. Everyone, whatever their politics has a pit in their stomach and your bracha to put more weight in the boat, more Torah in the boat, more community and to try to find an ark in unity. So Donnie, we're just very grateful to you for this wonderful talk. Um, I just want to end with uh, two wonderful announcements. One is that um, Micha is going to be teaching us on November 15th uh, at 10 a.m. So we're trying to have Torah for Kimitzion, Tetzay, Torah, Udavarat, and Naim, Yerushalayim. We're trying to fulfill this every month. And uh, Donnie, we're so grateful for you doing it in October. And Micha is going to be doing it on November 15th. But you do not have to wait until November 15th for Torah from Jerusalem. Tomorrow at noon, uh, Hartman is continuing the second week of its seminar on um, democracy, citizenship, and Judaism. So there's gonna be a lecture tomorrow at noon, and then we'll do a Zoom chat to kind of follow up on it. Amy, who's the teacher tomorrow at noon? 
You know, I don't know off the top of my head. I can check really quickly. It's either Alex K or Yehuda Kurtzer or Michal Bitone, but it will, be somebody. it will be somebody great. But two things I want to say. One is if you join at noon immediately afterward, you can um, join in on a Zoom session and Wes will unpack for us. And the other is um, somebody just asked me about how we'll announce the recording. I'm not sure which recording we're talking about, but um, a recording of most of Donnie's fantastic teaching will be on our um, on our website under Hartman Selected Lectures. That was the question. Uh, so a recording of this um, class will be with all the other Hartman lectures that we record under Hartman Selected Lectures on our website. And for updates on the monthly Hartman um, Scholar that we'll have on Sunday mornings at 10, look at the Hartman Learning Initiative page and we'll post it there. But the next two months are both Micha on a Sunday morning at, at 10 a.m. And Donnie, thank you. Fantastic and beautiful teaching as always. We just love you guys. We love you so much and we love your teaching. So thank you, thank you. Total sparkler. Thank you all so much. Thank you.